everybody. Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Hello, everybody. It's Monday here on the program. Yeah, you know what that means. We got a lot to talk about here today. Well, let's see. We had uh, Rampage on Friday where CM Punk announced that he's injured, but he's not relinquishing the AEW title. We're going to find out uh, who the new interim AEW champion is at Forbidden Door, and thus we'll tell you all about this whole rigmarole. We had Hell in a Cell last night. We had NXT 2.0 in your house on Saturday. We have Raw tonight. And yes, I guess we got to talk about Cody now, don't we? Mm, yes. You know, uh, before the show, Semper Vivi sent me a message, and he said, how did we manage to get the Sasha story, the MJF story, and now the Cody story? All th- How could we be so lucky? And, uh, and what I said, my opinion, is that it's not that we got three stories that people are reacting like, you know, whatever to. But it's the fact that now we're at a point in life where people react like that to every major story. So this ain't going to end. Cody is just the latest. You know, by the end of this week, something else is going to happen and everybody's going to have to plant their flag and, and get all passionate about it. But I'm going to try to talk a little bit about Cody in a way that maybe everybody won't go crazy. (laughs) I'm going to. Anyway, we'll get going after the break, everybody. Observer Live. Um, All right, let's let's try not to waste too much time on this, okay? We don't have to talk about this all day, everybody. You know that, right? So, Cody suffered a torn pec. It was known Saturday night. Hell in a Cell was Sunday, and WWE announced the news on the pre-show. And and there's actually a really funny part of it. So they announced the news on the pre-show, and then later they have the announcers clear up the story and then tell you what the actual story was. It was was totally bizarre. They were like... uh, you know, the story is out that uh, uh, Cody was hurt in a brawl with Seth Rollins on Monday in Torres Peck. But that's not true. Cody was injured, but then tore his peck. They like, it was just, it was weird. It was like, what? But anyway, so Cody tore his peck, working out, and uh, they acknowledged that. And, uh, and then they pushed that he was still going to do the show. And so uh, Cody comes down to the ring, and he's got his jacket on. And you can already see before he even takes his jacket off, like the middle of his chest, it's, it's all purple. So he takes his jacket off, and uh, this bloke's got a torn peck. It's purple and blue all over his chest, down his arm. I mean, it's, it's gruesome. And, like, for the first five minutes of the match, the, the crowd's almost in stunned silence. They're like, oh, my God. How is this guy doing this and why? And uh, and he does the match. And about, uh, you know, 10, 10 minutes in, you know, the fans start to realize, you know, his, his arm hasn't fallen off yet. And they haven't stopped the match. I feel I can safely get into this now. And so they got into it. And, uh, you know, by the end, I mean, torn peck or no torn peck, they had a great match. And when you add the torn peck story to it, I mean, it was just, I think the word Dave used was compelling, and bro, was it ever. And uh, this guy, he won, and the crowd goes nuts for him, and he's kissing the mat, and he's crying, and he's thanking the fans, and and this dude just comes off as like the biggest baby face in the history of, of mankind. And you know, we talk about it on the show and everything like that, and then... The blowback started. I turned the show off as soon as I heard one good thing about you guys said about Cody. We can't be uh, glorifying and and uh, he. Sh- this is the big one. He shouldn't have been in there. Okay, listen. As a fan, 
And as a guy who likes Cody, I was grimacing the entire time. I was so worried about this guy. And uh, and obviously, I, I did not think that he should have been in the ring with that torn peck, okay? But, as I noted yesterday, they have doctors in WWE. And no matter what you want to say, these doctors aren't jokes, okay? These doctors, if if they feel that it is a danger for you to get into the ring, they will not let you in the ring. They will not clear you. There was that incident where uh, uh, Brian Danielson uh, got injured in a match with Triple H, and they stopped the match, and he, Brian Danielson was furious. He was so mad, he almost fought Triple H after the match. But they, they stopped the match. They wouldn't let him do the match. They have retired people. They have, they have permanently retired people. And I put that in quotes because some of them, like Paige, are still permanently retired. Others, like Edge and Daniel Bryan, were permanently retired. But then, you know, they ended up being not retired. And, uh, you know, if you, if you follow the Brian Danielson story, I mean, the WWE doctor was the last guy. He was the last holdout. Brian Danielson had gone to multiple doctors who were like, bro, you can do this again. You don't need to be permanently retired. And it was the WWE doctor that was the final holdout before he was finally allowed to come back into the ring. Okay? Now, I realize that we live in an age where there is an internet. Okay? And this accelerated during COVID. Everybody decided that they were a doctor, okay? But you know what? Most of you aren't doctors, all right? And the doctor in WWE decided that it was okay for Cody to go out there and do that match. Now, there's another doctor. I've actually got his name. And uh, you can go up and watch his video on YouTube. His name is, uh, and of course, it's not right here, but... I'm going to get it in just a moment. His name is... Uh, Dr. Nick. Brian Sutterer, okay? Hi. And uh, he does this for a living. And he did a five-minute video where he talked about the injury that Cody suffered and uh, the risks of going out there. And uh, and it's funny because this video is, is uh, it's out there. And uh, I've already seen people cherry-picking what they want to hear in his video. Because he actually was very balanced about it. But when you're balanced, then what happens is people can cherry-pick what side they want to go with. Okay? And, uh, and what he said was, the pec was torn off the bone, and you can't tear it anymore off the bone. It's not like he's going to go in there and do any more damage to the pec. Okay? He did say that, yes... Obviously, we, when you have an injury like that, you can overcompensate with other parts of your body and suffer another injury. That can happen. But his conclusion at the end was that it was probably very painful for Cody. But anybody who is saying that, like, a doctor would be negligent to allow Cody to go into the ring... He does not feel that it was negligent to allow Cody to go back into the ring. So, at the end of the day, like, dude, I don't think he should have been in the ring either, okay? But the doctor in WWE and another doctor here both believed it was not negligent to allow Cody Rhodes to go into the ring. So, I don't even know what we're arguing about! It doesn't matter what your non-medical gut tells you, okay? The doctor believed that Cody could go into the ring and do this match. And then, you know, other people were like, oh, well, this never happens in real sports. And then, you know, people pointed out that actually it does happen in real sports. And here are a bunch of examples. But, bro, that's not even a fair comparison. Because wrestling isn't a real sport. Like... The whole point of wrestling is to go in there and protect your opponent. That's the point. So Cody wasn't going into a real sporting event where Seth Rollins didn't care one way or the other whether his peck is torn. He's going to beat the crap out of him. Or, or in MMA, he's going to target an injury. They went in there with the idea to protect Cody Rhodes. That's the whole point of pro wrestling. 
So you can't even make a comparison. Well, oh, you know, uh, the Super Bowl this year, this guy had a torn peck and he played. That's the Super Bowl. It's real. So anyway, uh, I, I understand. I, I think that he shouldn't have been in there. But at the end of the day, the doctor felt it was okay. Another doctor felt it was okay. So I don't even know why this is like a big argument about the safety and negligence and everything like that. The actual medical professional said it wasn't negligent to let him go in there. Right? Yeah. Well, the, the visceral reaction to that, to how it looked, you know, especially for a lot of people who are not into sports, saw that and go, that's a torn pack. We're being told it's for real a torn pack. It looks like that. How in the world can this person go out there? Because you can, and it's not, and again, look, a lot of people immediately, it's toxic masculinity, it's meatheadedness, it's it's dumb jockness. It's like, no, it, it's, it's actually not. If this person could go and perform and the person he's working with felt comfortable and a doctor said, look, the only thing you can do is if you can gut through it, go ahead. And I'm, and I'm used to that from the NFL and the NHL, so... There's a there's a whole lot of things that could be true. Should WWE can you have be have the opinion that maybe they should have not let him go in there at all? Yes. Is there's a lot of what ifs and there's a lot of things that are frankly true about this, including the fact that he was cleared by a doctor and he was able to go out there and perform. And you don't know what Cody and WWE talked about as far as paying for the surgery and all that stuff. So I know we're going to break. We'll be back. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Um. Well, thankfully, we got another injury to talk about. What's that? Maybe thankfully is not the right word. Well, yeah, that's a little dark. CM Punk has broken things. <laughs> what? Excuse me? Fangs? He broke some things. He, he broke some things. That's what huh. we know for sure. It is believed that it's a broken foot, okay? All but right. one way or the other, things are broken. And so, uh, well, that's a multiple. Did he break like he said a foot things? And some toes, bro. Do you know what a foot is? There's a bunch yeah. of bones in there. <laughs> if you break three little bones in your foot, they still say you have a broken foot. He said things, so probably he broke a few bones in his foot. Would be my guess. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> you deserve that. For now that you're now attitude. you're trying to yeah. kill me. <laughs> See, get all choked up there. <laughs> hey, if you keep this up, we'll go back to talking about Cody. Don't threaten me. So he came out on uh, Rampage, and he announced that uh, that he broke some things and that he had offered to uh, relinquish the AEW title, but Tony Khan told him no. And so this is what is going to happen. CM Punk is going to take time off to uh, heal his things, and in the meantime, this coming Wednesday, there's going to be a battle royal on Dynamite. We don't know how many people. We don't know anything about it. There will be some people in a battle royal, okay? Whichever person wins will be having a match with John Moxley in the main event of Dynamite on Wednesday. That man is going to go to Forbidden Door and face the winner of Hiroshi Tanahashi and Hiroki Goto for the interim... AEW championship, okay? Now, what are they going to do? I got no idea. What would I do? What do I think would be awesome? I think it would be awesome. It's so funny. Say Goto. Say Goto. No. Say I think, Goto and Luther. Say it. Say I think it. it would be awesome if, uh, if John Moxley faced Hiroshi Tanahashi and Hiroshi Tanahashi beat him and became the AEW champion. Now, Hallelujah. let me give you my mindset here, okay? So, clearly the match they wanted to do was, was CM Punk against Hiroshi Tanahashi, okay? Which actually was a match that I, I had suggested before they announced it. Because it has to be like a big New Japan name. But it also has to be a big New Japan name that they don't mind beating that guy. They don't mind that guy losing in an AEW title match. And uh, Tanahashi's perfect, okay? But before they announce this, the match that they have been building forever, that everybody wants to see, 
is John Moxley and Hiroshi Tanahashi. But they didn't do that on this show. And I was thinking, why? And the answer may simply be that they wanted to do Punk versus Tanahashi and, and whatever. But, you know, there was also that thought that, uh, you know, maybe maybe New Japan, when, when they want to do Tanahashi versus Moxley, but they want it to be on a New Japan show, and they want Tanahashi to win. So maybe that's why it's not happening on Forbidden Door. Maybe... You know, so anyway, I don't know if any of this is true. All I know is that originally it was going to be CM Punk defending the AEW title against Hiroshi Tanahashi. Now, obviously, the monkey wrench of a broken things was thrown into the plan. So why not just have Tanahashi win the AEW title? And then two or three months from now, when CM Punk is is good to go, you do the match that you were planning to do the entire time, which was Punk versus Tanahashi, which presumably Punk was going to win, and Punk beats Tanahashi, and he unifies the AEW and interim titles, and then away you go. Everything is exactly how you had it planned in June. You're just doing it in August instead. So that's what I do. But I'm not Tony Khan. If you've ever seen one of my press conferences. So, we'll see what he ends up doing. And there's going to be an education process, which would need to happen if you went in that direction. And I actually like that direction. Um, because it adds, you know, from a pro wrestling point of view, and Tony Khan's a big pro wrestling fan. You see how he modeled those Owen Hart belts after the Stampede belts. And he's a big belt mark. And that stuff means something to him. You know, the fact that you can add to your lineage by having, again, one of, even though there's some people out there who don't know him, one of the greatest professional wrestlers of all time, one certainly one of the best baby faces of all time, Hiroshi Tanahashi, who can still perform at a highly entertaining level and still have really good matches every once in a while. He can't do it on a regular basis. But the fact that you can have that, I think, is a great idea. Now... Obviously, he's not going to be able to, you know, he can emote on as far as getting over on American TV because of the way he wrestles, because of his personality, because of his style, his flash. You know, he's brothers in the Three Musketeers with Shibata and Shinsuke Nakamura. And you saw how Nakamura got over here. Tanahashi, once people see him and take to him, I don't think there's going to be a problem with the American fan base, but there is going to be a little bit of education that has to go on. And this gives you a chance because you don't have a guy who's going to be cutting promos and taking up that time per se when it comes to, you know, time on the show. It gives other people a chance to speak and it gives you a chance to do some things with some other people. And that's what this battle royal could possibly do is lead to some new ideas and lead to some things that you can do coming out of this thing. And we don't know who's in it. We don't know how many people are in it, but one would assume the entire top 10. And then I guess a group, you know, of 10 extra people that you would have in there, because I assume it's not going to be everybody in like two rings or something like that. Doesn't make any sense. It cheapens it. So only have your best people out there in including Wardlow, who maybe gets screwed over by an Ethan Page or a Scorpio Sky, which leads to him going after Sky for the, the, the TNT title, which he has alluded to in an interview. That, again, that's fantasy booking, but there's a lot of things that could come out of this. Bottom line is Tanahashi as a choice for champion. I'm all for it. also want to mention that there was a uh, story in Business Insider by Claire Atkinson, and uh, this from PW Insider because the actual article was behind a paywall. And yes, I pay for PW Insider, but not Business Insider. In the piece, it was noted that Stephanie McMahon's leave of absence, which was publicly described as McMahon taking a break to tend to her family, was actually, quote, executed by her father, Vince McMahon, the organization's 76-year-old CEO. The article noted responsibilities that fell under Stephanie's umbrella included marketing, brand business, and creative services, along with community and entertainment relations. Company announced a new executive vice president, head of marketing today, Catherine Newman, noting her responsibilities will include marketing, brand, community relations, entertainment re uh, relations, creative services, and photography, much of the same responsibilities McMahon had. Article noted, while Stephanie had described the potential of WWE's growth in sponsorship and marketing as having the potential to be in the, quote, hundreds of millions of dollars range, that wasn't happening under McMahon. Atkinson, citing a company source, reported, We are seeing that growth, uh, said the company insider of Stephanie's tenure. When someone is moved out of a company, it is usually the result of something not working. 
We took stronger control of that a few months ago. Now, uh, the way this is uh, phrased, it sounds like Vince fired Stephanie McMahon, but uh, I don't believe that that happened. And I think Dave's going to have more on that here in a little while. But I can tell you what is undoubtedly true, okay? So Stephanie stepped away from her duties, all right? And it had been a long time coming. She had she had talked to people about stepping away from her duties, uh, dating back to when uh, Triple H had his his heart issue. So this was this was coming for a while, okay. But the day that it happened, it was made very clear she is stepping away. She's going to spend time with her family. She will be back, and in the meantime, uh, her duties will be split amongst different people. Different people will be taking on a little bit extra, but we're going to spread it out amongst a bunch of people. All right, that's fine. Well, then, a little while later, a week or two, all of a sudden, like, they were hiring people for her role. That's when I first got a red flag. Like, huh, you're hiring people to take on what Stephanie used to do. Hmm. And, uh, and then, in fact, as, uh, as we talked about on some of the shows in, in Vegas, uh, you know, WWE, all of a sudden, for some reason, did a 180, and they wanted word out that Stephanie was not very good at her job. Now, what happened? Why? I have no idea. But uh, clearly... Uh, the folks that wanted the word out that Stephanie was not good at her job contacted Claire Atkinson here of Business Insider, and uh, they, in fact, got the story out as well. So I don't know what happened. I don't know if Stephanie will ever be back, but something happened and something changed, and, uh, and that's the latest as of right now. Do you know if Catherine is one of Victor's daughters from Genoa City? Who? Don't worry about that. Look, this place is now getting much, much bigger. And I know we, especially old people like us, we've always had a McMahon family, whether it be Vince Sr. giving the company to Vince Jr. And then seeing Shane and Stephanie come into it. Linda, you know, became a, a featured person. But we see where Nick Khan has taken this company and we see some of the moves that they've made that... You know, when they went with the network idea, then when they got rid of the people that started the network and went in the direction that they're going in now, you see the deals that Khan has landed. And it's like, maybe this thing is actually now at a level where, yeah, it's now out of their hands. It's time they maybe do something else for everybody. And this is the way evolution happens in business. Back in a moment, Observer Live. And didn't we? Yeah, we did. All right, so if you've not seen it yet, watch the uh, Young Bucks versus uh, Penton Phoenix match on Rampage. That match was better than anything on the pay-per-view. It was so unbelievably awesome. So that was Friday. Uh, you can skip SmackDown. And I can give you permission. But if you want to hear the report, Tom and I are going to uh, do the report on that, as well as New Japan Strong coming up in uh, 2 o'clock Pacific. 5 Eastern, video.f4wonline.com. And, you guys uh, got to talk a little GCW Tournament of Survival, too? No, WrestlingObserver.com as well. <laughs> well, we didn't hey. see it. What do you want me to do? Well, was he uh, was he wrestling for Black Label this weekend? I have no idea what he was doing. You should ask him, though. I was in quarantine. Know his man's schedule. It's your partner. We also Close had uh, the NXT 2.0 show. And uh, very quickly, we had uh, the family, Tony D'Angelo's crew, they beat uh, Legato del Fantasma. So now Legato del Fantasma will be uh, gangsters, I guess. Match was pretty good. All things considered, it was a pretty good match. I liked it. Toxic Attraction versus Katana Chance and Caden Carter. Not good. This was not a good match. In fact, it was pretty bad. Although, I thought Caden Carter looked good. And uh, Katana Chance... But come on, we know her name. But anyway, she's improved, and they, they were pretty good. But uh, uh, Toxic Attraction retained the tag team titles because, you know, 
we got to, we got to, you know, if you keep trying, eventually those 18 to 49 year old males are going to tune in to see these women with almost no clothes on. We just got to keep trying. Yeah. Uh, Carmelo Hayes beat Cameron Grimes to win the NXT North American title. It was a good match. This was a good match, as you would expect. Manny Rose beat Wendy Chu, of course, to retain the NXT women's title. And uh, this was not good. It was pretty bad. The Creed brothers beat pretty deadly. I like this match. Because you know what? I like these Creeds. I like these Creeds. Watching the Creed brothers is like watching UFC 1. A Styles <laughs> Clash... You're afraid, you know, maybe someone could be killed, but thankfully no one does get killed. And uh, you just never know what's going to happen with these guys. They're just, uh, they're like, they're like two uh, 1997 Goldbergs just out there running rampant. And these these good workers are trying to carry them and, and they sort of can. I thought this was a fun match and the Creeds won and uh, they won the NXT Tag Team titles in front of their parents. I like this. This was good do, stuff. Do you remember the old Johnny Valentine line? A lot of people have used it where it's like, I can't make you believe that wrestling is real, but I can damn you sure make you believe that I'm real. Like, there is almost nothing NXT 2.0 can do to make me convinced that any of it is real and not just one big hallucinatory cartoon. But the creeds, you'll never make me believe that they're not real. They are amazing puppies with big paws as jr would always say they are amazing athletes and they are is if as close to one could come to actually what it was like being thrown around by the steiners watching somebody do that that's exactly what they are doing right now and we had uh braun breaker versus joe gacy and uh they got to get this Braun Breaker away from Joe Gacy like as soon as humanly possible. Like, I'm I'm going to be losing money ago. at this rate. My Holy God, smokes. this has taken this guy from like the hottest prospect in all of WWE to some bloke having average matches on pay per view. It's it's the worst. So the story was he could lose the title via DQ. So they teased that a couple of times, but he didn't, and he won. Can we move on now? They That's my review that. of NXT oh. 2.0 in your house. And it was so bad because nobody believed that. They, so he, every time it was, he would kick out at two, and then they would show a, a close up of Braun Breaker, and it's like he can't lose it. Like, okay. And then they did a bit with a chair about seventy five million times. The referee takes it away in slow motion, turns his back to walk away to put. It's like, can you at least try if you're gonna like do this? At least try. And the guys tried. I mean, Joe Gacy is, he's fine. It's just the gimmick is death, and this feud has been death, and it hasn't helped Braun Breaker, and it sucks, and I wish it was over. Please. This I person here is saying Brian's going to lose his bet because of Joe Gacy. It's, I mean, Joe Gacy is going to cost me more money than MJF. No, he's not. With his MJF no, coin. No, he's not. Look, once he breaks away from him, look, once anything happens with NXT, once he goes up to the main roster, that's really, at the end of the day, the bottom line, because there's only so much damage they can do for him in NXT as far as his whole career, which wasn't that what that was whole thing was about. They'll ruin this guy. They'll ruin his WWE career. All right. Uh, he's not ruined everybody. He's just in the middle of an absolutely boring, nothing happening, generic feud Which, with a guy he needs to again, get away from. But no one's get, no one's watching it going, oh, this Braun sucks now. Well, to be Everyone's fair, saying, can he get a new opponent? It does get him ready for the main roster. It sure does. Speaking of the main roster, Money in the Bank, uh, Bianca beat Asuka and Becky in a three-way was which, awesome. which was an excellent match, which, of course, led to, you know, somebody having to go out of their way to start a thread on our board asking why poor Asuka is just being buried all the time. God, it's like the people who are anti-Bianca that, like, crawled out of holes on Twitter last night. Just beat these people in the head with a shovel, put them back in there, and make sure you pat it up and they can't get back out again. People are out of their minds. Like, if you want to say that Charlotte, Serena Deeb is a better technical wrestler, absolutely. You want to say that Asuka is underused and, and a person that, because of her experience and, and her style, is a far more valuable prospect if everything were to fall apart than somebody the age of Bianca Belair. But look, bottom line is she is the biggest thing in women's wrestling outside of Japan, bar none. 
to for for her to have picked up what she's picked up so far to be the athlete she is to see how she comes across and to see like all those things that don't matter in the ring like marketing potential and a spokesperson for the company and a, a role model and an influencer and all that sort of stuff like Man, she is it. So I don't know why there are people that maybe they're just trying to be contrarian. Well, you know, maybe I do it's remember. for other reasons. I do remember when I was a wrestler and it, Tim Flowers would say, hey, you know what? You're going to uh, headline the Temple Theater with me in a singles match for the ICW Championship. Uh, but I'm going to beat you. And I, I say to him, no, 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 no. I, I don't want to headline in a championship match. I don't want to headline the Temple Theater in a title match if I'm going to lose. I'd, I'd rather work Mr. Sexy in the second match on the card so that I could win. <laughs> Get out of there early? No, the hell not. Bobby Lashley beat Omos and MVP. <laughs> and then he prayed around with the belt. So What do you think about MVP's uh, rhymes? Oh, dude, it was awesome. <laughs> MVP's rap was like multiples better than anything on Raw last week, anything on SmackDown, and uh, and this match. Kevin Owens beat Ezekiel, just pinned him clean in the middle. We have not had the uh, the cameo by Elias yet. And, you know, after this match, it's like, why is this feud continuing to get to that? Uh, but uh, I guess we'll see if, if, uh, oh. if they had the any foresight whatsoever to tape one guitar shot before they cut the guy's hair and shaved his beard. I, I absolutely hope so. And much like when it comes to any any time talking about Kevin Owens, there's always something that you don't see and you got to go back online to see. He does, I guess, the talking smack or whatever the post show is called afterwards. And he talks about knowing back in the day when Rikishi became the Sultan and knowing that that's who that was. It's just it, it's a small, dumb thing, but it just that's what's making this feud great for me is Kevin Owens being a one man show when it comes to having a field day with this stuff it, it's it's great we had uh the judgment day beating aj finn balor and Liv morgan like this match good match everybody worked hard they got uh 16 minutes and uh edge got the win i don't know where any of this leads but uh that's what happened so i liked it madcap moss happy corbin so we had a we had an issue that played out in the main event which was they had a false Count Anywhere match, and WWE decided to go old school. Well, we're using a table in the main event, so we can't use one earlier in the show. But it's a, it's a no-holds-barred match. The fans, for how long did this match go? 12-minute match. It was 12.05. So for 12 minutes and 4 seconds, the fans chanted for tables, and they didn't get tables. And so finally, in the main event, when heel Seth Rollins who's wrestling, you know, Cody Rhodes with his arm dangling from his side. Seth Rollins grabs a table, and the fans have been waiting so long that they pop, and they start th thanking Seth Rollins for getting a table. Like, I know there's rules, rules and everything, but, bro, you should just give these guys tables. It doesn't matter. It would have made things much better in the, the main event for people not cheering Seth Rollins. But anyway, they had a hardcore match, and then uh, Madcap pilmanizes his neck with the steps and a chair. One, and uh, and yeah, he's got a new he's got a new look and everything, but he's still Madcap. That blows. It absolutely stinks. Riddick Moss is his is a gimmick name anyway, but it sounds like a wrestler. Look at the guy, and you go, that guy's name is Riddick Moss. You go, look at him. You go, I believe that name. It fits who he is. Not just that, dude, but they're all into just one name. Bro, just call him Riddick. Riddick. That's actually that's, cool. That's his Bronson, last name Riddick. is like, you know, something green that grows on a tree. You can oh. get rid of that part. That's Just call him Riddick. That's he comes out up. there all jacked up, you know, like me, huh? And he beats on people, doesn't tell stupid jokes, and they call him Riddick. <laughs> you can just even hear Vince saying it. Riddick. Yeah, Riddick. He should have chose Riddick instead of Riddick. Theory. Because Man well, Theory had the most vanilla, nothing happening. Bro, maybe Riddick down the line can kill Theory. And 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 look, and it's nothing against Austin Theory because he's in, insanely talented, but he's been positioned as a geek that he's not getting over. And the, the specter of him 
defeating John Cena down the line bothers me. And Riddick Moss has been, I'm not saying he's been ready for a long time. He's one of those guys came from the NFL, went there. That's all he knows. But the, like, the guy has been a physical wonder. We've talked about how underused he's been for a long time. Now's the time. Oh, Try man. Try not to screw it up. Our Twitch chat, sometimes they're dumb, but sometimes they got such great ideas. Like, What's that? You know, if, 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 if Riddick came out with, like, you know, antlers, like, uh, you know, uh, House of Black, and they called him Riddick Moose, and his finish could be the ridiculous. There's a lot of good ones here. Jesus. All better than Madcap. It's too bad that Happy Corbin has blocked you because he could take some of this stuff and actually apply it to him still telling jokes, I guess, to Riddick if he gets out of traction with his neck and whatnot. Let's see how long it takes for him to sell this. What, yeah. a back in a week with nothing happening? So, yeah, Ali comes out. They say Chicago's own Ali. Oh, here's Ooh. his wife, children, yeah. friends. Uh, and then he, he got beat. Uh, of course he did. And then uh, Cody Rhodes beat Seth Rollins in the main event. Yes, if you didn't know, by the way, if, if you've been listening to the show, Cody won. He hit him with a sledgehammer, and he pinned him 3-0 and against Seth Rollins, even with a torn peck. So uh, they got plans, clearly, you know time for? for this guy's big return and eventual WWE title win. Come back at the Royal Rumble. It'll take four to six months anyway. That's about when it goes. Royal Rumble would be perfect for something like that, especially if you don't have The Rock. But even then, you got multiple nights. Perfect time to bring Cody back then. Uh, when when it comes to like the short term though, like <laughs> now you got to figure some stuff out like quickly, including bro. They don't need to figure on, anything out. They got no how, plans. no. Wait, hold on. How you plan on rebuilding Seth Rollins? Because I am interested now. He loses to Cody three times in a row. Did all the mind games? They all failed. He's there with his banged up. He loses to a guy with a, 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 a an arm falling off and a peck falling off. What do you got next Sam, for Seth here? Bro, I love you, but dude, it's WWE. It doesn't make a bit of difference <laughs> that he lost three straight matches to Cody. He's going to come out here. He's going to do his stupid laugh. <laughs> he's going to do his goofy dance. He's going to cut a promo, and everyone's going to forget all about it and move on to whatever his goofy feud is. We've seen this a million times. Eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, WWE fan. I can't think of one WWE person that's pushed as a main eventer where anything happens to them, and all of a sudden the fans don't see them as a star anymore. This audience, they're told he's a star, so he is. Hey, and they're like, they, yes! <laughs> they have about two million really passionate people, and that's good for them. And so do we. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Yo. How long did you test positive for? Um, it was at least five days. Uh, I'm still positive today. Yeah. How long has it been for you now? Uh, five, I think. Well, hopefully it's five days. Hopefully that's it. Is everybody else in the house? Dude, I know. Okay. I know someone who tested positive for two months afterwards. Oh God, the long COVID. Well, no, they were. They just tested positive, but oh. they 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 just like they got over it, but they kept testing positive for two months. Jesus. So, sucks. Oh, get out of here. These Me? Nerds on the chat. Oh, those. Not talking about herpes, you geek. <laughs> talking about COVID. Well. <sighs> hey, you know, Cody's going to be on the show tonight. He doesn't have gonorrhea, does he? What? Cody's going to be talking about his torn pec. Uh, torn and pec. what's That's next? That's what it was. I forgot what it was. But we do the know that he will be undergoing surgery for said torn pec on Aye. Thursday. That's when it's going to be happening. And they will film all that for the network. Oh, Every man, they're going to have a documentary someday, brother, let me tell you. Dude, that's it's iconic. That that will be there forever. Much like his neck tattoo, that, that bruise will live in either infamy or whatever you want to call it. We're out of time, everybody. Got to wrap it up in an hour. Myself and Filthy Tom will be uh, talking all this fun stuff. It'll be at uh, 2 Pacific, 5 Eastern, video.f4wonline.com, audio, wrestlingobserver.com. Check that out later on. And uh, that's it, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you again after a while.